All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Boca Podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Holritz. It's good to have you here today. Uh, I hope that those of you that do join the live stream uh, will share, ask questions, comment, engage in conversation with myself and my brand new guests who are introduced here in just a second. Uh, make sure to take advantage of the opportunity to, to really be a part of the show. I hope that you'll do that. And of course, it's the biggest advantage of being part of the live stream. For those of you that aren't listening or watching to the live stream currently, you're hearing this after the fact. If you follow us at Boca Podcast, B-O-K-E-H Podcast on Instagram, you can keep up to date with the upcoming live stream schedule and uh, come be part of it. We do them Mondays and or Fridays. And uh, so you can kind of mark that in your schedule, usually around noon Eastern time. And then, of course, the show is produced by Photographer's Edit. So for those of you photographers that are getting into busy season now, make sure to go check out photographersedit.com for your post-production needs, custom editing for the professional photographer. All right. On that note, I want to bring in a brand new guest. Charles Mole is here with me today. Charles, thank you for coming to do the show. We didn't really get a chance to catch up a whole lot before we got started. So I'll get to know you along with our listeners, but thanks for, for doing the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thanks so much for having me. I'm super stoked to be here. And yeah, I've been listening to the podcast for a while. So excited to get to be a part of it. Well, and, and truly, I appreciate it. I, I don't take it lightly that uh, various photographers, at this point, we've done well over 600 episodes, but photographers kind of from across the country and occasionally internationally as well, make time out of their busy week to come be a part of the show. And I do appreciate that. We were chatting just briefly before we got started, maybe to give our listeners uh, a little bit of context. You're based in Bozeman, Montana. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. So yeah, I've been here about 10 years and then uh, yeah, I went to school here for photography, then met my wife and she's lived in Montana her whole life. And I think, yeah, she's a fifth generation Montanan and they still awesome. have their homestead property here. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I can imagine the the beautiful property too. I, I mentioned to you before we got started, but Montana is one of those kind of places on my short list of places to live or to at least have a second home. I, it just the scenery out there, I can't get enough of. I took my kids out that direction a few years back. Um, we made a little trip and had so much fun there. But um, I can imagine too that that starting and then running a business in Montana might be a little bit of a different experience than say somebody who's starting in Atlanta or LA or something like that. How long have you been in business for yourself and what's that startup process looked like? Yeah, so I initially started my business uh, in 2017 after I graduated college. It was just kind of a side hustle thing for quite a while. I worked for um, a couple different nonprofits doing marketing and um, photography and videography and kind of shot all over the world with that. Um, but then like in 2019, it was like, I'm going to go full into photography, full into um, wedding photography specifically, just fell in love with it after shooting a couple weddings. And um, yeah, 2019 wasn't necessarily the best year to start a business because then 2020 <laughs> rolled around and yeah. kind of kicked my ass and, you know, but that was okay. And I mean, I think with how it is in Montana, there's like a million people in the whole state. So that means you just drive a lot to photograph. Like it's pretty normal that you'll drive like three to six hours to photograph a wedding. It just, Whoa. that's just kind of, that's just how it goes. Um, so yeah, you get to see a lot of the state, but there's a lot of time behind the wheel for sure. Does that, do you get tired of driving? I know a lot of people talk about getting tired driving and I personally, even living here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, we live in a pretty beautiful area, but I just enjoy the opportunity to get out and maybe kind of the monotony of being in the car, stick some music or podcast on, or just be in the quiet and look at the scenery. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm still like a little kid, but I just love that. Do you, do you, does it ever get old yeah, driving I, around that area? I love driving. I, I mean, I'll go on drives on like the weekend with my wife for fun. Like, so I don't know. You kind of got to love it or, or hate it up here. I mean, it just, <laughs> you drive a lot. Um, like everything's at least an hour away, it feels like. So, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, it, the next step, if you don't have one already, is to get a motorcycle because you, you can enjoy that open road and the open air. Yeah. There's nothing like it. Yeah, no, that would be the dream. I mean, I don't know. It is snowy here quite a bit, so you don't get as many months as I would like for that. And Smaller. One of yes. these days, I'll convince Shorter my season, wife. Shorter season, I bet. Yeah. 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 Well, for those of you listening in, I, I want to make sure that you get a chance to follow what Charles is doing. So if you go to uh, just Charles, like it sounds, mole, M-O-L-L dot com, you can check out Charles' website there and his work. And then if you go to Instagram, it's charles.mole underscore 
photo. And of course, I'll pop that up on the screen throughout our, our show today. And you can go check that out. Make sure you follow him and check out his work there. We are going to be talking about how to take a better candid photo. And, and we'll get to that topic here in just a second. But there's an introductory question I'd like to ask my guest, Charles, uh, because this whole podcast is based around the premise of helping photographers build sustainable businesses. That's what I ultimately want to shine oh. the most light on. How do you create a business that minimizes that sense of overwhelm that allows you to work efficiently enough so that you can also have a life outside of work. That's really important to me. And, and I'm kind of trying to spread the word for other photographers out there as well. Is there a big idea or principle that's enabled you to find some level of balance between work and, and your personal life? Yeah, definitely. Um, a while back, I read this book. It's called uh, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And I think the main key idea is just stuck with me. It's Basically, hurry is the death of a spiritual life, and it's got to be ruthlessly eliminated. You don't just decide, oh, I'm going to be less busy. It's like you have to be very intentional about how can I eliminate busyness from my life. Um, yeah, I mean, I've that book has definitely been hugely impactful. Um, and, and I think what, is there a particular idea or principle from that book that you've applied to your life? Because it sounds appealing. Yeah. I think one of the big things is just this idea um, of eliminating, automating and delegating um, things. So first off, like eliminating, just even asking, like, is what I'm doing worth my time? Like, I think that's probably one of those hard questions to ask because I know I love doing everything. I love trying to see if I can, you know, do it all or, oh, no, is this going to be the thing that's going to like be the most worthwhile? But I think a good example of this early on in my business, I joined this business networking group where every week you're supposed to bring at least one lead to another business. And then in theory, like you would get leads for your business, but I didn't know that many people. So I ended up just making myself a lead to all these businesses and I wouldn't actually get leads. So I would end up wasting an hour of a week going to this thing. I would end up spending money at all these businesses and then like not getting any business. And I just had to ask the question, like, is this actually worth my time investment? Um, cause you know, at the same time I was working a full-time job doing photography and it's like, I think I can spend this hour of the week better. Or yeah. if I'm not spending my work, like I'd rather spend that going fishing or something like that. <laughs> so the, but, but those list of three points are really interesting. They're very similar to some principles that I've talked about here in the podcast before elimination and then yeah. automation and then delegation. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, that's correct. That's a pretty incredible list. Elimination, I, the way that I reference that is to simplify, I, as in minimize the number of moving parts in your life, in your business, like you said, that aren't absolutely necessary. If, if we go through our whole day and look at how we spend our time, I mean, literally everything from making our bed to scrolling Instagram to um, you know, cleaning our house, whatever it might be, and of course, all the activities associated with running a business, it's interesting how we, it's, it's very easy to fill space at the end of the day. And a lot of those things that we fill space with aren't directly correlated to us achieving personal goals, professional goals. And, and I get we want space for just relaxing. But outside of that, I wonder how much time we waste. Like if we were to look at a percentage of, of the day that we might waste doing things that aren't actually helpful to our end goals. So I, I think it's really great suggestion. That's elimination or simplification. Automation. Can you give a simple example of how you automate some element of your business? Totally. I mean, I think that was something I just was forced to learn when I right kind of before I took my business from like the part time thing to like the full time thing. So was really working, you know, full time at a pretty like intense job plus full time in my business. And it's like I really used HoneyBook a lot to automate my customer experience, just those repetitive emails, um, because honestly, it's like I was so exhausted that I would just totally forget things like I'm terrible at remembering stuff and I don't want my clients to lack having a good experience just because I'm unable to remember, Oh, I should have sent that email or I should have sent that email. Um, so just building like these, you know, anything that's going to be repeatable, like how can I automate this to, you know, enhance my time or speed things up a bit. Um, yep. Another tool I use a lot is like after shoot for AI culling. Um, you know, it's not huge, but it'll cut an hour out of culling a wedding, which I mean, that's an hour that I can use for anything else. Um, or even like using some of the AI tools for drafting blog posts, like getting that first draft, that's going to save me an hour 
and then I can go through and just clean it up. Um, and I think that just gives to a better, better life, honestly, because then you're not so exhausted. Yeah, you mentioned using AI tools for blogging. I, I used uh, ChatGPT actually not very long ago to draft an article that I was writing for someone. I, I will say that I ultimately ended up writing it myself because there wasn't enough of a personal element to it. But when it yeah. came to the quality of content that, that ChatGPT generated, the the grammar even um, that, it, that it actually used when it was writing, it was really, really impressive. So I, I think those tools right now are a great place to, to start. Maybe you tweak, you edit, personalize it a little bit. And they can certainly save us a lot of time. There's there's this thing that's been kind of ringing through my head too. I don't know if you found this uh, yourself as you're using those tools, but uh, I think it was Gary Vaynerchuk that I heard it from first anyway. And he was talking about how these tools are particularly effective for those who are, who are good at ideating or being creative, coming up with the idea to begin with. If you don't have ideas, then these, these tools like ChatGPT aren't as effective. If you have the ideas, you can utilize these tools as kind of an assistant to help you be more productive. What do you think? Absolutely. No, I would totally agree. I mean, I think like for me, I love coming up with ideas. I was did marketing before photography. So it's like just coming up with ideas are like, that's just what I like to do. And yeah, it, it really will enhance the final product that's going to come out of any of those sure. chat GT or whatever. Um, and I think with that too, you're able to, like you're going to have to go through it again and even continue to think like, how can I make this better? Um, and you know, reprompt it or just go in and rewrite whole sections of it to make it. <laughs> yeah. Happen. Cause it's like, yeah, it's not going to sound like my writing or your writing, but it'll give a starting place. And like, there's still that need for the human creative element for sure. Yeah, for sure. So we've got simplification or elimination automation and then delegation. How have you utilized delegation in your business? I mean, I think one of the biggest ways is actually through outsourcing um, my initial editing. Um, and actually, I've used Photographer's Edit, which is a great tool where Shout out. You know, I'll spend all this time where, yeah, I mean, gosh, that's 30 hours just doing those base edits. And man, if I could spend that time meeting with like another wedding vendor to build that relationship for my business, or I don't know, getting a new client, meeting with clients, enhancing my customer experience or even just spending time with my wife. I'd rather do that than just spending it on that editing. That isn't the final touches that I'm going to put on. It's like, I'll go back through and really put those fine touches on and like get it to the quality that I want. But that initial outsourcing of the bulk of the editing just has saved so much time and has made my business actually a lot more livable and given me the ability to, just do a lot more and not feel so exhausted. Wow. That's awesome. Well, thanks for the very kind shout out. And for those of you listening in, if you are curious about that, you can just go check it out. Photographers edit.com. But yeah, I, I very much appreciate those kind words, Charles. And and for those of you that are curious too, we, we mentioned the book earlier. I'll pull this up on screen. Uh, the ruthless elimination of hurry, how to stay emotionally healthy and spiritually alive in the chaos of the modern world. It's definitely piqued my interest. It's by John Ortberg. We'll link to that in the show notes at bocapodcast.com as well. And uh, you can check out that book. Charles, let's just go ahead and jump into our main topic for the day. And actually, before I do, I want to say hello to Sue is chiming in from Sun Valley. Thanks, Sue, for being so consistent and being part of the show. And for the rest of you that might be live streaming with us, don't be shy. Say hello. Let us know where you're listening from. And of course, take advantage of the opportunity to ask questions along the way as well. We're going to be talking today about how to take better candid images. And uh, Charles is a wedding photographer, but of course, a lot of these principles are gonna probably be applicable to portrait photographers as well, or family lifestyle portrait photographers. Before we kind of get into those principles that are driving your ability to, to take a great candid photo though, Charles, I'd love to define this, at least define the, the term candid the way that you look at it or utilize it in your yeah. photography. Because I think a lot of times these days, photographers will say that they take candid photos, but a lot of times those so-called candid photos are actually like hybrid candids, if you will. Like they set the couple up or they'll set the subjects up and then they kind of step back and photograph them as opposed to being truly objectively candid. How, how do you see candid photos? What does that actually mean to you? Yeah, no, I would say 
like that's a great question because early on like something that really frustrated me um, when I was you know looking into starting my wedding photography business was you know I'd go on photographers websites their p positioning statement would say like authentic or candid imagery and like of course the photos would be beautiful but they would always be like these very perfect looking images and it's like yeah. that's awesome like I wish I could do the things that some of those photographers do. Um, but for me, what I would say it is, is it's anything that's unplanned, natural, and just that beauty that kind of comes in imperfection um, rather than just trying to keep everything so perfect. Um, capturing, yeah, capturing the humanity of people, I think is really mm. what it's about. Yeah, well, and even on your website, for those of you listening in, of course, you've heard me talk a lot about brand positioning and a brand position statement. And Charles's brand position statement is right there at the top of the, the page, candid storytelling, celebrating your love's natural beauty. And so I guess maybe just to kind of sum up what you at least seem to be suggesting, Charles, when you're talking about candid photography, you're talking about photos that you managed to capture without setting the subjects up. Is that right? Yeah, primarily. I mean, of course, like I'm a wedding photographer. You do the family formals. You're going to oh, do sure. like those portraits. And yeah, with like those portraits kind of doing that hybrid you were talking about where you'll set people up and then you know, try to draw out like who they actually are. But the majority of clients that come to me, they'll just say like, I don't want to, like, I don't want to be posed. Like, I just want to enjoy my wedding day. Please just take pictures. I don't like having my picture taken. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's kind of fun to work with people who are, who don't love photography and be able to give them photography that they actually enjoy. Mm, I, yeah, I like how you frame that. That's cool. Okay, so let's just get into the principles. And I'm, I told you before we got started, I'm literally going to have a notebook right here. I'm taking notes. You mentioned that you've got six ideas that drive your ability yeah. to take a great candid photo. And for those of you listening in, of course, you can take advantage of these, these tools, these principles that Charles is about to share. And again, don't be shy for those of you that are live streaming to ask questions as we go along the way. Charles, go to town. I'm going to start taking notes. Yeah, I mean, first off, I'd split these like six ideas into two different parts. Um, the first would be more on the mindset end of things. And then just the second chunk would be, okay, like practically, how do you do this? Okay, cool. And the first um, mindset piece would just be people over the portfolio. Hmm. I think like during my consultation process, one of the questions I ask everyone is if there was one photo missed on your wedding day, that would absolutely devastate you. Like what would that photo be? And nine times out of 10, what people say, it's like, seeing my spouse for the first time, my dad crying when he sees me in my wedding dress. Mm -hmm. I don't know, uncle Steve going wild on the dance floor. Like, <laughs> very, very rarely do I hear people say, Oh, like this detail or that detail. And if they do say a detail, it's usually because it's sentimental and it ties to a person. Mm -hmm. And I think like, I don't know. I think we as photographers and like myself included in this, we can start to get really self-serving when it comes to our clients and forget that like our photos are actually for people like and they're about the people that they treasure i mean like you i can go into a wedding day and like my goal can be creating beautiful images but i'm trying to do that to get it published or to win an award or get a lot of likes on instagram and it's like that's actually not the best like rather than just giving like we should just give our clients images that are going to celebrate like who they are in their wedding day. And if, yeah, if you get published, if you win awards, get a lot of likes, like that's a great outflow. But I think as soon as that goal becomes primary, that our portfolio is like what we want, we're going to start missing what matters and missing the people ultimately. I love that. Beautifully summed up. By the way, I'm a talker, so I naturally want to respond all kinds of different ways to what you just said, but I'm trying to do a better job as an interview and let the guests lead the way. So I, I'm just going to leave that where it is. B just beautifully summed up. I think focus on service of our clients really needs to continue to be prioritized more in our industry. So that's lovely. Take us to number two. Yeah. Uh, number two is being fully present. Um, so early, like when I graduated college, I think like all my friends got married within like one year of each other. So I went to a ton of weddings. I was in a ton of weddings. And around this time, I knew I wanted to get into wedding photography. So I was just kind of this weird guy who would creepily watch the photographer all day. Um, <laughs> I didn't really, I mean, the wedding was fine, but I would get bored and just see what they were doing, see yeah. kind of how they navigated it. And what I realized, like, you could see all these different styles. You'd see your more photojournalistic photographers, your more like fine art photographers. 
Um, but I think what really stood out to me, like what set different photographers apart was the best photographers were like very present. They weren't. And the thing that really stood out to me is like they never checked their back screen. They were just always taking photos. They were always engaged with the couple. They were always like moving. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the photographers who their images were lacking in quality, like at the end, you would see them on the wedding day, like sitting against the wall and just checking through their photos. And I think like what just cemented this in my mind was I attended this wedding at a, as a guest where this bride just starts going freaking wild on the dance floor. And I'm like, this is, this is like the shot. Like if I was shooting this wedding, this would be like the shot that sums up the wedding day. And I look for the photographer. I'm like, Oh man, how are they going to pull this off? And this photographer is outside of the dance floor, like face glued to the back screen, just scrolling through the photos. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, painful <laughs> and of, course, like, of course like we're gonna miss photos you need to check your back screen like that that happens but i think we can get stuck in this fear-based mentality where we're always looking at the last photo we took rather than the next photo um and just can get so caught up in you know oh no like what if i messed up that last photo it's like we're gonna mess up photos you're gonna overexpose you're gonna underexpose but it's like that fully present piece of, okay, where's the next impactful moment? Um, and I think it's like, anytime you see those award-winning photos, like those take place at a normal wedding. It's not like it was some, I mean, of course there's like those outliers where it's just a wild experience, but most of them it's like, I've seen most of those moments at a normal wedding, but those photographers were just very present and able to, catch those instantaneous moments because they were aware and just cultivating that awareness and then reacting quickly um, during the day. I will share two quick thoughts here. One that comes to mind when you talk about being present, I, I noticed this uh, even today, I saw somebody look at their watch when a notification came through. It's very easy, whether it's our watch or phone or anything else to allow those things to distract us. And we need to turn off anything that's not absolutely necessary. I realize clients, friends, family members on, on a wedding day may be trying to, to communicate with us in some way, a coordinator maybe. So we have to and allow for some of that, but anything that we can do to minimize distractions, we should be doing. And it, it drives me crazy, you know, that people will put their phones down at dinner, but then leave the notifications on on their watch and you constantly yeah. see them do this thing, looking at their watch and notifications. I'm like, yeah. how rude, but, but there's just this lack of awareness. But especially when it comes to photographing a wedding day and engaging with clients, the last thing that we need to be doing is allowing anything else to distract us. So I love that you bring that to light. And the other thing I just want to throw out there for those of you listening in is do, do the work as a photographer, practice your craft outside of that event so that the necessity, the so-called quote unquote necessity to look at the back of our screen is minimized. You can be confident in what you're doing. Yeah, occasionally double check. But we can minimize that necessity if we're actually doing the work ahead of time. We're comfortable with our gear, comfortable with our abilities, and we can just focus on shooting. I think that's really, really yep. important. So number one is people over portfolio. And again, I just loved how you summed that up. Number two, be fully present. Take us to number three, if you will. Yeah, you actually kind of alluded to it, which is confidence. Um, it's like, I think, and this is the hardest mindset of taking any sort of, I mean, great photo, but I think in candid photos as well, like, it's such a hard mindset to cultivate like and one i constantly find myself struggling with but it's coming into a space and thinking like i'm gonna pour my heart and soul into this shoot and give these photo people like the absolute best photos imaginable not from like a prideful way of like oh i'm the best photographer but like no they hired me they trust me like okay i'm gonna show up and i'm gonna knock this out of the park and i think like i mean just this past week like i was photographing um a wedding vendor event where it was like all these inter industry professionals I'm like holy hell that is the most imposter syndrome i have had in years <laughs> like when you're taking photos of people who like take photos and do events for a living sure. it was like should i be here have i like conned my way into this somehow um but like really the internal struggles like no like i i do belong here i do i should take these photos and like i'm gonna do my best and i'm gonna like i'm gonna kill it and I think, um, yeah, like this is where it starts to move into a bit more of the practicals. Um, we have that confidence piece of getting into the day and just not worrying so much. Like, 
are are these people going to be like mad that I'm taking their photos or am I an inconvenience at this wedding? Like, no, like I, I'm, I'm here. I'm the photographer. I'm going to shoot it and I'm going to do well. That's it. But you, but you can have that confidence because you're putting the work in too. You know, there's, there's a yep. lot of discussion in our industry about imposter syndrome. We've talked about it a good bit on the podcast as of late, actually. And certainly a lot of conversation around insecurities. And I heard something the other day, I think it was from Alex Hormozzi, but he was talking about how, you know, people will go stand in front of the mirror and recite these affirmations and try to pump themselves yep. up and, and, you know, read books about, how to deal with their insecurities or whatever it might be. But at the end of the day, what we really need to be doing is the work repetition, put the reps in, put the practice in over and over and over and over and over again, our skill set and our ultimately our craft and the work is going to speak for itself. And so there's really very little actual need for us to be concerned about our abilities, unless we're just getting started and we've only put so many reps in. But put the reps in, we naturally will develop confidence as a result. And then these other conversations almost become irrelevant. At least that's my yeah. simplistic perspective. What do you think? No, I think that's, I mean, I think that's a good point. Like, yeah, you, you got to do the work. Like you can't just say you're a great photographer. Like you have to take the great photos. Like you have to spend years practicing and, you know, it does take time. Um, and like, of course, I think those voices can come in and, convince you that you're not actually that like good at what you do. But I mean, that's why over time, I think you'll get the social proof and it'll show like, yeah, I, I actually do belong in these spaces. Yeah. Yeah. The social proof, the work, the business ultimately, because you know, we are running a photography business at the end of the day. If clients are paying yeah. for our work and they're continuing to do that and hopefully at even greater levels, that speaks yeah. for itself. And so there's th that voice that comes you know, from inside somewhere that is causing us to question our abilities is really at that point irrelevant. And we can yeah. objectively give it less attention, if any attention totally. at all, because the work is speaking for itself. But that's, I, it, it was such a, it re re resonated with me too, because um, for, you know, for any amount of insecurity that I might have at some point, I can literally negate that if I just put the work in and have the actual proof yep. for what I'm capable of. That's going to speak for itself at the end of the day. So let's just collectively, I want to encourage everybody listening and watching, let's put the reps in and we can set aside at least the majority of this conversation around, um, I mean, any kind of doubt, insecurity around what we're actually capable of because the work and the business will speak for itself. I, I think that's such an important conversation. So we've got people over portfolio, number one. Number two is to be fully present. Uh, number three, confidence. And what, let's just, I, I like calls to action, actionable advice. So what, as it comes to confidence, what would be that action that you'd recommend to our listeners? I know I, I talked a lot in this point, but I'd love to hear your take on what you would recommend listeners do to, to develop that confidence. I mean, I think like what I've, at least what I've done for myself is whenever there's something I'm afraid to do, like business wise, if there's a photo I'm afraid to take. I'm like, I should probably go do that. Like, pressing into that fear rather than that's it just saying, oh i'm scared i don't want to deal with that like screw that like no go do it give it a give it a whirl and i think eventually you start getting more comfortable in those fear spaces because it's not as as big yeah so press into the fear and and do the reps to build confidence there there's our call to action i love that okay cool yeah. so that's number three cool. take us to number four if you will yeah so this is when it starts moving into like the practical parts, like, okay, when you're actually photographing, like how can you create the, those better images? And the first off is like blending in with the day and moving with purpose or like get in and get out. Um, and I think what I found is the best way to have people not pay attention to you is just take a lot of photos. Like you start far away and you move closer in and within no time, like people just totally forget that you're there. And you just become like a fixture of the wedding day. You just kind of blend in with the background, with the caterers. Um, I can remember one client where they just, I think they said, they're like, we didn't even notice you there. And then when we'd want you to take a photograph, we just turn and you'd already be there getting a picture of it. It's like, in reality, I was standing next to these people the entire day. Like I was within like five feet of them most of the time. And it was just because I was there, they forgot about me. Um, mm. Now it, I have to ask you, and this may be a, yeah. a funny question, but when we say blend in by continuing to 
take lots of photos. What's the alternative to that? Is that like people might or photographers might blend in less if they're just kind of standing there watching or what what have you seen happen when you're watching yeah. other photographers well I've, I've noticed this myself like if i am walking around with like the camera at my side just kind of moving around and i see a photo and bring the camera up to my eye people immediately stop what they're doing like uh. it fail. like if you're just kind of walking around lurking around the outside you're like that scary photographer who's just <laughs> you're like, oh no don't take my picture <laughs> but if you're just taking a lot of pictures people are like ah photographer taking pictures and they just kind of forget about it. Um, and I think like part of this is when you're like taking photos, like don't awkwardly sneak over to a place, like move with purpose. You get over there, you take your photo, of course, take time to compose the image, take the photo and get out. Like you don't need to just like lurk there and just uh, be awkward. Like just keep moving, keep moving through the space. Uh, when you have your camera, like keeping it close to your eye or like keeping your flip screen open so you can, you know, get photos from different angles. But it's like, if you're ready and prepared, you can quickly take the photos. People won't notice you and you can just keep moving. Um, and I like they forget that. about it more than keep moving, keep shooting and blend in with the day. That's, that's really, really yeah. good. Yeah. It, it, it's, I guess as much time as we spend as wedding photographers at a wedding, I shot weddings for over 10 years, so I have yeah. a lot of experience with this, but as much time as we spend there, you're right. I guess that the person just kind of standing to the side with the camera slung over their, their shoulder might look a little bit awkward, but as long as we've created that, established that really great relationship with the client up front the best we can, and then we just, we just get working. We're shooting a lot, we're moving a lot. Yeah, I can see how we would naturally just blend in as a result. It's an interesting way to talk about it. I've never really quite heard that perspective before. A lot of times you'll hear about, you know, photographers say, be like a ninja, just disappear into the background and you know, stay in the shadows. But I like this perspective. It's a lot more practical. So that's cool. Okay, so number four, blend in with the day by taking lots of photos and continuing to move. What's number five? Yeah, number five is get closer. Like the first thing like I want to say here is get closer. doesn't mean just pull out a bigger zoom lens. Like I think that's a way that you can be safe and kind of emotionally detached from a space. If you're standing like clear on the other side of like a venue with, you know, a giant birding lens, like, yeah, you can take those photos. that will feel close or look close, but you can't actually hear the conversations. You can't feel the emotions because you're not like proximate to it. Um, like, of course there's situations where you need a 70 to 200, um, proximate. I, think when I you, like that word proximate. I don't think yeah. I've had any guests use that word on the show yet. <laughs> okay. Heck yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think just using lenses that force you to get a little closer and feel the emotion, um, like with, with the couple, with the people on the day. Um, I mean, I'd say like basically using a 35 millimeter or wider, like for me, I'm using a 24 to 70 and most of the day I'm like 24 to 35 but i i really like the way that the 24 um looks with a lens that wide you just have to be close to make a good photo um, so how does this then work in conjunction with your previous point because i can imagine that in fact i know again from personal experience that not everybody's comfortable with that photographer being right there in their face yeah. in fact i was just photographing some friends of mine just recently who are also photographers and yeah. i stepped in i was i was photographing with my phone actually and i stepped in close got very close to, to Heather and Heather's like, Oh, that's, that's really close. Even as a photographer, it felt yeah. really close that I was, you know, probably within, I don't know, maybe two or three feet of her, if that. So yeah. how do you reckon, or how do you, um, I guess make sense of number four, where we're talking about blending in the, with the day, but with also being really close to these subjects. I mean, part of that setting expectations prior to the wedding, like I will in my consultation be like, Hey, this, like, I'm going to be close to you throughout the day. Um, so they kind of go into it knowing like, oh, he's, he'll be near us. And then two, it's like shooting the whole wedding day. I mean, I think most of my weddings I'll do like full day coverage, um, just to be there the whole time. And I think that helps with that blending in because when you're there, you know, during the getting ready photos and you start a little further away and then they get more comfortable, you just keep moving in closer and closer by the end of getting ready photos it just kind of gets normal that you'd be that close and they still forget about you because it just has become like what their expectation is. That makes that sense. You've said. It's like, yeah, if you were shooting a far away all this, the whole day and then all of a sudden you like came right up in someone's face with a 24, 
that would be super uncomfortable. They'd be off put, but you like slowly like train your subjects of like, Hey, I'm going to be, I'm getting closer. And it just becomes normal and they kind of forget that it's weird. That totally makes sense. Okay, good. I appreciate that context. And I'm assuming during the ceremony, are, are you at during the ceremony usually using a longer lens, stepping back and out of the way, or do you tend to use the wide angles then too? Uh, I use probably 70 millimeter most of the time um, okay. or less, I think. Wow. And it's just, yeah, moving that deliberate movement. Like, yeah, I'm not going to just like lurk right in front of the bride and groom, but you know, you walk right by, you get a quick photo and then you move out of the way so people can still see. And it's just constantly moving, constantly changing perspective. And I don't know, like at the end of the day, people have hired you to take photos of their day and to take great photos. And like, sometimes you're going to block people's view. And I think that's okay. I know some people would disagree with that, but yeah, a hot take. I like that. Spending, people are spending a lot of money to like have you document their day. And like at the end of it, any guest that you've blocked their view for a second, they're going to totally forget about that. Um, but the couple's going to remember their photos for the rest of their life. And like they've paid you good money to capture good photos. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, cool. Well, let's, let's go to number six here to finish off the conversation. What is the sixth idea that kind of encourages better candid photos? Yeah. And this I'd say is kind of the art of it, but eliminating distracting elements, looking outside standard moments, and then just waiting. Um, like you have to kind of train your eye to see. Um, I think it's like what Henry Cartier-Bresson calls the decisive moment where you compose an image and then you wait for the shot. Like sometimes that's going to be instantaneous. Other times that's going to be waiting 30 seconds, maybe a little longer. Um, and then like during the wedding, it can just be easy to only do the standard moments, the kiss, the first dance, that sort of stuff. But it's looking outside of those, like, okay, during the first dance, who are the people on the periphery? What are they doing? Like, is I think like one of my favorite photos um, was um, this mom girl's mom was getting married for the second time and uh, it was her first dance with her new husband and her daughter's standing in the background with like the breakfast club fist pump in the air and it's like looking outside like the general first dance photos like if you're just taking those first dance images only of the couple you kind of miss the other people that are part of the day and pulling them in during the ceremony it's not just taking pictures of the bride and groom it's taking pictures of the bridemaid's maid who's like bawling her eyes out or you know the mom and dad just getting looking outside of like those big moments so how are other people responding hmm. um, okay so yeah we could sum this up with just look outside the big moments because that that is an interesting perspective. I wrote down a number of things here or a couple of other things as well. You talked about compose and wait, and I really like that. The only thing I, when you talk about compose and wait though, is there a chance if you've composed and you're waiting for a shot to happen within that frame, then that you then miss something over here? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think you're always going to miss photos on a day. Um, okay. I mean, it's partially like composing it and then, you know, I'll hold my camera there. Yeah. Like look around, see if anything else is happening. Look back at the photo, like just gen being generally aware of what's going on. Okay. Um, Do you photograph with both eyes open? Yep. Same. Yeah. I don't yeah. know how many photographers do. I'm sure plenty do. I don't know how popular yeah. it is across the industry, but man, it makes, it, it takes a little bit of training for somebody. If, if you're listening or watching and you've, you've never tried yeah. this before, you, it does take a little bit of practice where your brain kind of acclimates to the idea that it's essentially taking in two different pictures simultaneously. Yep. But it, you talk about that awareness and looking for those moments outside of the, the kind of stereotypical wedding moments, it, it, it enables that. And it's really, really great sure. once you get used to it. Yeah, no, definitely. And then yeah, the other thing just on the composition piece is like finding that way to get separation between your subjects and the background. Um, so, and also between subjects and other subjects or subjects or just stuff in the frame. And I think the best way to do this is getting lower than or higher than your subject. It's like everyone kind of sees the world from that, I don't know, five foot to six foot range. Uh, so bringing your camera outside of that height range is going to create one, just a more compelling image, but two, like when you're shooting from down low, you're putting people against the ceiling. 
So it gives them separation from all the other people and really isolates that moment. Um, or, you know, you get up higher, same sort of thing. And then just is this as what you watching, meant earlier by eliminating distractions, is, is this, is this yep. what you were referring to? Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And then, um, just watching like when people are moving, like not having like them overlap in the image, like wait till there's that bit of separation between two people. And then that's when you can get a better image because they aren't overlapped. It gives it that space, a little bit of breathing room. And then like you can see each person's emotion a little better and it doesn't get as blurry. It feels like. Huh. That's interesting. It, it, describe a little bit more for me and our listeners, both when you talk about creating yeah. separation between the subject and then people that might be in the background, can you describe yeah. that in a little bit more detail? What does that look like? How would you do that? Yeah. I mean, first off is just like, if you, you know, let's say there's a mom and a bride hugging. Sure, you could shoot it straight on, like from like where I'm standing. But with that, there's going to be, you know, all the guests in the background. So the way you could just change that is get a little bit higher because then your frame's going to cut off those guests in the background or Makes you could sense. get lower. And then that'll, you know, put them against like a ceiling as their background rather than a wall of guests. And then Got it that just adds that bit of compelling nature to the image. I like that. Yeah. You know, I, I'm a minimalist to a fault. And, and the reason I say this in the context of photography is it's very easy for me to, I love a 50 millimeter lens. Let's take a 50 millimeter lens, 2.8 at four, maybe if we're yeah. doing some group pictures, five, six, but just like, keep it simple, minimal gear, take the picture. It looks mm -hmm. great to me. Just keeping it really simple. Yeah. And part of, what can be wrong with that approach is that then you're just taking everything. It all looks the same. It all runs together. And, and to your point, Charles, it all looks very much like the perspective that we're all used to seeing. And even if it's a percentage of the photographs uh, at a wedding that you're, that you're capturing to shift perspective generates a certain element of creativity, obviously, but variety for the end viewer, which is really makes the images that much more compelling. I hadn't really thought about it from the context of creating separation between the subjects and, and their background. I think that's really, really great, but it's a good reminder, at least for me anyway, maybe for, for some of our listeners as well to shift perspective a little bit, because that can make all the difference in the world. The caveat of course, being we can take it to the extreme there was this 10, I think it was a 10 and a half millimeter fisheye lens that I used to love to shoot with. The problem is we okay. used it a bit too much. There was like a period of time we were shooting weddings where I think I used it too much. You could overdo that stuff as well, but mixing up perspective yeah. can really make a difference in the quality of, of the finished work. Yeah. Yeah. That's oh, good. Definitely. Okay. I, I oh, say that again. Sorry. I just always try to use like, yeah, well, I'm, for every photo that I'm taking, like with a 24 millimeter, going to use an 85 as well to, because each of them is going to have a different feel. It's like an 85 is going to create like a very, at least I feel like a very serene moment because it's got that compression in the space, the flatness. It, feels very peaceful. It's like that 20 mil, 24 millimeter is going to have that image pop and just be a lot more dynamic. But it's like not every moment needs to have that dynamic punch to it because not every moment does is super dynamic. It's like a first dance is a more peaceful moment. So maybe do that with an 85 and it'll feel more romantic than getting all up in there with a 24. <laughs> okay, fair. Um, so I'm just going back through my notes here. Number one was people over portfolio. Number two, be fully present and in the moment, of course. And, and then number three, the importance of reps or practice, um, mm -hmm. and then actually pressing into the fear for the sake of developing confidence. Uh, that was number three. Number four, blend in by taking lots of photos and continuing to move. That was really interesting perspective. Number five is to, to get closer. And then I've added a couple of extra because you had some interesting points here at the end. And so I'm adding to this. But number six was to, to look outside the big moments like you were talking about, kind of the stereotypical wedding moments. Uh, number seven is to eliminate distracting elements by shifting perspective. I thought that was a really cool take. And then number eight is to compose and wait. And there is something really fun about that. I think back to, in fact, I used to, this is kind of random, but my hands used to shake. I had this kind of, I think they call it familiar, familial tremor. It's something that runs, mm. runs in the family. My, my uh, grandmother had it really bad. My dad uh, still does. And I used to, and then I started in photography years and years ago 
and when I was there and especially like on the dance floor waiting for a, you talk about composing and waiting, waiting for a moment yeah. or just kind of standing to the side with a 70 to 200 on, I learned to steady my hand as I'm just sitting there waiting. And mm -hmm. I literally that, that tremor, that mm -hmm. shake of my hands has gone away learning how to sit still and just be, uh, which is really fascinating. I, of course, totally unexpected, yeah. but there is something really cool about being in that position as photojournalists, capturing these candid moments where we just sit and we get to be quiet and we just get to wait. And then we just hit that shutter at the right second and capture that beautiful candid. I think this is a great, super, super practical set of reminders for all of our listeners as to how they can do that more effectively. Yeah. Well, thanks. It was, yeah, super fun. Well, it's super practical, and that's one of our main goals here at the show is practical, actionable information. So I really appreciate you being willing to take time to share with all of our listeners. For those of you listening in, make sure that you do go to Charles Moll, M-O-L-L dot com, and uh, you can follow Charles as well on Instagram, charles.moll underscore photo. Of course, we'll link to both of these in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. Charles, thanks once again. Truly appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. It was, it was great.